Good afternoon. On behalf of the Park Center for Independent Media, I welcome everyone who has joined this webinar today. My name is Raza Rumi, and I'm the director of the Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. Uh, and uh, I have a special uh, note of thanks for our great speakers, whom I shall introduce in a moment. Uh, the topic of our webinar, as you all know, is journalism in times of protest and pandemic. Uh, one of the key objectives of our center, the Park Center for Independent Media, is to examine the impact of independent media on journalism, democracy, society, and participatory cultures. Uh, the center's mission is to engage media producers and students at Ithaca College and elsewhere in dialogue and action about independent media, especially the outlets that are based in the US and which produce content on issues such as equity, social justice, and sustainability. Multiple conversations across the United States and the world are underway about the role of media amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent protests against racial violence, not just in the US, but globally, the media are once again struggling to cover the uprisings in a manner that is not a repetition of the past uh, years. Uh, while the mainstream media are covering both these transformational events, uh, numerous issues have been identified with respect to the coverage, framing, and focus of their reporting and the commentaries. And today we shall discuss how newsrooms in the independent media sector are ne negotiating with these difficult times. Uh, we hope to learn from our speakers on the coverage of a pandemic that has killed more than uh, 150,000 Americans and many more worldwide. Uh, the numbers grow. Uh, the last I looked uh, at was more than 600,000 people across the globe. Uh, misinformation has been cited as one of the many reasons for the growing number of deaths uh, due to COVID-19. And of course, the role of media is paramount in this context too. Uh, we shall also review in this webinar if recent reporting on racial justice protests represents a shift from the traditional underplaying of race in police stories and uh, uh, reporting of such nature. And finally, given the impact of economic slowdown, how are the independent media outlets, local journalism ventures are faring, and what should we expect in the future? Our distinguished panelists today include uh, Didi Guttenplan, who's the editor of The Nation. Uh, he previously covered the 2016 election as the magazine's editor at large, and for two decades before that was part of its London bureau. His most recent book, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority, has just come out in paperback. Do check it out. Our, uh, our next speaker would be Andrew Buncombe, who is the chief U uh, US correspondent for The Independent. Uh, he has previously reported from across Asia, and before that was a correspondent in Washington, DC. He's based in Seattle, a US, and is interested in politics, immigration, the environment, and the interface between technology and society. Dr. Tara Conley is an assistant professor of transmedia storytelling in the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Her research centers black life in the study and exploration of place, media histories, and technocultures. Our final speaker, <clears throat> Amanda Silverman, is the editorial director of Newsroom based in the Mother Jones San Francisco office. Before joining Mother Jones, Amanda worked as a story editor for Foreign Policy's print magazine. And prior to that, she was the deputy editor at the New Republic. So really excited to have uh, such an amazing panel. And without further ado, I would ask D.D. Guttenplan uh, to talk about um, uh, his experience at the nation and, and particularly his views on how uh, media are faring amid uh, both pandemic and the protest. Sure, thanks Roger for that generous introduction and for the chance to speak with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about first how the pandemic affected the nation. And for those of you who don't know, the nation's 155 year old uh, progressive magazine. Our, our politics have changed a little bit, but it was founded by abolitionists right after the Civil War. Uh, so we've had a very long commitment to racial justice. 
uh, and we've had a very long commi uh, commitment to telling the truth. Those, those things have never changed. Uh, other, other, other aspects of our values have gone in and out, but those things have remained constant in our history. Um, and the pandemic hit us hard because we're based in New York City and we've always been in New York City. Uh, and that means, that gives us a slightly acute angle, for example, on Washington, because we've never been based in Washington. Uh, so it means we've always felt a little bit, able to be a little bit detached from the political center of the country. But we were right in the epic epicenter of the pandemic when it hit. And uh, I confess that like a lot of other people, I underestimated the severity of it and how long it was going to last. Uh, I think some people on our staff were more prescient. We were discussing, you know, whether we would close the office. Uh, it, some of those discussions were actually fairly contentious, but we ended up closing the office on March 17th. Uh, and I remember that was a Tuesday. The Sunday before that was the last presidential debate, the last Democratic presidential debate. And we did a live stream of that. And I remember at the end of the debate, uh, that was the cutoff that night at midnight when bars were gonna be closed in New York City. And I remember saying, well, the bars are open, so you know, <laughs> go make hay while you can. Uh, and some people in my office thought that that was not a, not a funny joke, given what we were facing, and they were absolutely right. But you know, uh, I, I can't say that I saw the severity of it coming. Um, I would say that uh, it's been really testing for us. I mean, it's been very difficult to do reporting. You know, we had a big travel budget uh, for covering the election this year. I covered the election in 2016, and I went all over the country, uh, you know, to lots of states. And we can't do that kind of reporting. So it's, it's really changed the way we do what we do. Uh, we went from having an office where you could walk out and talk to people to having daily check-ins, uh, Zoom meetings every morning. Um, and, you know, some of our people uh, have nice places to live. Some have fairly austere places to live. We have interns who come to work for us for six months at a time, and they're not usually particular about where they're living because they're mostly spending time in the office, but suddenly they were spending all their time, you know, in their apartments with their roommates. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just been very stressful for people. And one of the decisions we made fairly early on was to put specifically our pandemic, our coronavirus coverage in front of our paywall. We have a paywall and we're pretty serious about it, but we thought we'd put our coronavirus coverage in front of it. And I noticed when we did that, that the Atlantic had done something similar. And then I noticed, you know, their subscriptions went way up. Well, our subscriptions didn't go way up. They didn't, they didn't go down. You know, they're generally trending upward during this crisis, which I guess is a good, you know, a small silver lining for us. Uh, but, uh, but what I noticed is that the Atlantic's coverage went up, uh, their subscriptions went up, and then they said they were laying off 20% of their staff and 20% of their staff was 60 plus people. Our whole staff of 50 people. And we publish, in normal times, we aim to publish seven or eight stories a day. During the first months of the pandemic, we were publishing 10 and 12 stories a day. So people were really working flat out. I mean, I was working 12 hour days for three solid months uh, because you know, we had the pandemic, and then we had the economic collapse, and then we had the uprising. So it's, you know, it's 1917 flu and 1933 Great Depression, and then suddenly we're in whatever, 1967, 68, uh, you know, racial justice struggle all at the same time. And uh, that's changed a lot of how we do what we do. It's had an enormous impact on our coverage. Uh, one thing I want to say is that we, like a lot of other publications, we took a pretty big hit financially because of the pandemic. Um, our subscriptions have held out, and indeed they've even grown, but in terms of other fundraising events, we can't do them, and we rely on events for a lot of the fundraising that we would normally do. So, you know, financially, it's been tough for us. Uh, and after a few weeks, I realized that we were publishing a lot of opinions, which is something we do. Uh, but we didn't, I felt like what we needed were some scientists, 
So one of the things I did is I went out and found a scientist, uh, Greg Gonsalves, who teaches at the School of Public Health at Yale. And he writes for us every, every other week now about you know, the science of the pandemic. And that's something that I felt we needed to do, you know, to bring in more factual reporting and more science reporting than we normally had. Um, and that led to other physicians and other researchers wanting to write for us because they saw the kind of impact that his pieces were having on the national conversation. And so we've really d discovered a whole new seam of writers, uh, some of whom, Rhea Boyd, who's a, a pediatrician on the West Coast, uh, who mostly writes about uh, the differential impacts of health and race, uh, you know, have had tremendous, uh, have done tremendous work for us. And it's really opened up our coverage in a certain way, but it's also really stressed people out. I mean, I feel like my staff are doing heroic work every week. Uh, we've tried to rise to the occasion, but it's exhausting and it continues to be exhausting. And it's, you know, we're all trying to struggle with this shift from it's a crisis and we're going all out to we're going to be living with this for a long time and how do we cope? And, you know, I'd love to hear from everybody else how they're figuring that out because that's, that's tough for us. Uh, and then with George Floyd and his murder, uh, that changed the way we work too. I mean, part of it is we had lots of, and we're still having, even now, even this week, even this late into the, you know, into the uprising, lots of very uncomfortable conversations about race. We're looking around at who's writing for us. We're looking around at who's working for us. We're looking around at who we assume our readers are. Uh, and, you know, that's, there's a lot of hard work to do. And uh, I can't say that we're even halfway done doing what we have to do, even in terms of our own internal discussions. But it's, it's definitely made us you know, it's definitely foregrounded race in a way that it, it sometimes hasn't been at the nation. I would like to think that our coverage has been intersectional even before intersectionality was a thing. Um, you know, we've always, as I said, we were founded by abolitionists 155 years ago. So we've always attended to race and I like to think we've attended to class and to gender. Um, but, you know, those conversations splinter into silos very easily. And I think for us, the struggle has been to hold those intersections together and to keep our eyes on all of these prizes together rather than to suddenly abandon, you know, uh, values that we know are important. Uh, but it's interesting. Here's a small thing, and then I'm, I'm going to stop because I feel like I'm in danger of talking for too long, which is um, one of our, our interns, um, raised with us this question of showing the faces of protesters. Now, I'm an old school newspaper person. I did my training in journalism in the beginning at the Village Voice, so alternative media from the beginning, but I worked at daily newspapers too. And, uh, you know, my impulse is if it's happening in public, you, you cover it and you can cover it and you have the right to cover it. But our, our interns who are all, you know, young people said to us, well, we live in an era of surveillance and facial recognition software and, you know, a state that imposes consequences on people and imposes consequences on people on a racialized basis. And that we need to be aware of that. Uh, and I confess that at first I thought, what are they talking about? But they made a really effective presentation to the whole editorial staff. And we published uh, a writer, Cynthia Greenlee from North Carolina, who talked exactly about how to cover an uprising without, without impeding the uprising. Because as I often say to our staff, we're not the New York Times, we take sides. So, you know, when there's a, a protest for Black Lives Matter, we're on the side of the protesters. That's where the nation situates itself. We center the experience of people who are protesting. But, you know, the thought, the thought that we might do that and not want to show people's faces or that they may not want their faces to be shown was something that we really had lots of conversations about. And the conversations were initiated by our interns. They were joined in by the editors. Uh, 
we drafted some guidelines about what we might do and how, and then we've just finally circulated the guidelines. We're basically making a commitment not to show the faces of protesters unless we have a reasonable confidence that they want their faces shown, particularly if they might be facing legal consequences for the kind of protests they're doing. Um, now, you know, they're guidelines, they're not rules. As we say in the beginning, uh, nothing in these guidelines excuses anybody at the nation from exercising either editorial judgment or moral judgment. Um, but it's, it's changed the way we work. So it's had a big impact, you know, on what we do and how we do it. Um, so uh, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll uh, get back uh, you sure. know, to you with my follow-up questions, particularly on uh, the issue of class that you've highlighted, often sidelined or undermined in the mainstream media. Uh, so before I go on to our next uh, speaker, I'd like to remind the attendees uh, that we have uh, uh, you know, um, a large chunk of this webinar devoted to, to, to the Q&A session. So please uh, post your questions in the Q&A uh, chat, um, chat um, Q, uh, box and uh, we shall attend to all of them. Uh, please keep them short and succinct so that we can have as many voices covered in this conversation as, uh, um, as possible. Uh, so I'll move on to our next speaker. Um, uh, whom I've already introduced, Andrew Buncom is the chief U.S. correspondent for the Independent UK, and uh, uh, one of the key, re uh, you know, reasons or, or uh, inspiration for this webinar was Andrew's uh, work and the fact that he was arrested in Seattle while covering a Black Lives Matter protest, and uh, that uh, speaks of the extraordinary times uh, that we all are sort of passing through, but also the media environment in the U.S. And I would like. Andrew to cover uh, both these issues among other things. So over to you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks so much, Raza, and thanks for having this. It's uh, really important and, you know, great to be here on such a uh, esteemed panel. Um, I'm not gonna, an awful lot of what Don said um, also echoes for the independent in terms of the way we've been financially hit and the way that we've had to work sort of 12 hour days. So I'm not gonna cover a lot of that what, um, where, where it repeats. But let me, um, let, me, let me just very quickly outline a little bit about The Independent. It's a British-based newspaper set up 30 years ago at a time of intense political conflict in Britain. Um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, hugely toxic, hugely divisive. And the idea was we were just gonna tell the facts and let people have their own opinions. Um, at the, you know, we haven't uh, always stuck to that. We do have opinions, uh, and we're on the side of um, uh, we're, we're on the side of most progressive causes, I guess. Um, one of the interesting things about us, since we went largely online, we found that more than half our readers are in the U.S. That's allowed us to have more than more staff than ever before here. I'm guessing about 25% of our staff are in the U.K. in the U.S. My own experience in the United States, I've been here on and off for 20 years, um, back and forth with trips elsewhere and assignments elsewhere, um, most recently in New York and now in Seattle. Um, Seattle's a fascinating place to cover the coronavirus because it was here that we had the first case back in January. It was where we had the first deaths. And of course, since George Floyd's death, it's also been a site of intense um, um, protest. And I got back from covering the protests in Minneapolis uh, at the end of, uh, end of May to, to find that um, the protest here um, was in an area called Capitol Hill where protesters occupied the zone. It was called the CHOP, the CHAZ, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And for about a couple of months, um, it was it, li it lived this kind of uneasy half-life where the protesters occupied it and it was pretty peaceful during the day and the police kept out of the way. There was some crime at night, not necessarily involving people involved in the protest, but it was used by the conservatives. It was used by Donald Trump and it was used by, I think, members of the police force who wanted to retake that area. On July the 1st, um, they moved in. I went to cover um, the, the operation to close that camp and I was arrested uh, even though I was displaying my press badge uh, 
and maintaining that I had the right to be there. Um, I was held about 10 hours. I was assaulted. I was handcuffed. I was put in leg irons. Uh, and for, a, you know, let's be honest about this. It was a great insight for a, for, for a reporter, but what a great insight into privilege and, and the privilege of being a middle-class, middle-aged white guy with a press badge tiny uh, insight into the sort of experiences, uh, far, far, far worse experiences um, uh, held the, the people of color, people without my perch undergo every day into this criminal justice system. So I was able to write about that. Um, I've since been out talking to, uh, to protesters again and uh, I think Don word that use that word intersectionality. It feels to me we're at such an intense time in the United States right now. We have the coronavirus, we have uh, the election, and we have the racial justice protests. Never, never has the time for independent, honest journalism been more important. And yet never perhaps has the threat to that journalism been greater because not only have the financial threat that Don mentioned, but we also have the threat of doing our jobs. And we have to assume that some of this comes from Donald Trump. There have been at least 50 journalists who have been arrested this year while covering protests. I go to Trump rallies. I guess I've been to 10 of them or 12 or whatever. And when the president gets up and sort of says, that's the media back there, and everyone boos, the first time you kind of laugh because you think, ah, oh, this is like some pantomime thing and everyone's booing and hissing. But the second and the third time, it sort of it starts to get more sinister. And when you talk to his supporters, and you know, I I love going to rallies, no matter the candidates, to talk to their supporters about what draws them there. But what I find so fascinating is they don't want to talk to me. So, oh no, the president says you're fake news, and you're going to tell lies. I, you know, I have to convince them. No, I've come, I've flown in from wherever to to, to talk to you. If I didn't want to do that. I just stay on, you know, watch it on CNN. So, but clearly that's having an impact. Whether I was arrested because of Donald Trump, I don't know. As people have pointed out, Seattle is a democratic controlled city, a democratic controlled, controlled state. But I think the environment, and I think this is an inarguably true, the, the environment against journalism has got far worse and far less pleasant. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. And uh, that was uh, indeed uh, um, a very, uh, I, I, don't know, I don't want to use the word riveting, uh, but certainly worrying account on both the media environment and the work, uh, basic work that journalists ought to be doing at this critical time in, uh, in, uh, in our recent history. Uh, so I uh, would remind all the participants once again, please post your questions in the Q&A box, uh, keep them short, succinct, to the point. Don't leave long comments, please, because we want to incorporate as many voices as possible in this webinar. And I would uh, move on to after an, uh, Andrew's account um, uh, in Seattle and what went, uh, you know, what went wrong and, and what experienced and faced and saw, um, it's the right time to move to Dr. Tyra Conley, who is a professor of uh, media studies and communications. And uh, Dr. Tyra, over to you without further ado. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Don and Andrew, for sharing some of your experiences. Um, in, in your, your profession. I, I first want to acknowledge sort of where I come into this discussion. Um, I come into the discussion from a perspective of, of a black woman, uh, a feminist media scholar, and a storyteller. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that first is because um, I, I cannot separate, you know, how I live in the world with how others, um, you know, see me and see others and how they cover that in the world, right? So when I think about specifically how mainstream, mainstream media in this context um, covers protests and racial violence in particular, um, I'm always considering um, sort of the power dynamics at play uh, when it comes to, in this case, media institutions, both mainstream and independent media institutions and just everyday people. Um, so, you know, what, what we do know is, is this, when it comes to protests and, and the coverage of protests and racial violence in particular, um, media, I guess, tends to favor like the status quo. Um, 
and you know this has been you know studied since the 1970s with the Vietnam War and the Kent State shootings in my in my home state of Ohio, um, and you know scholars will call this uh, the, the protest paradigm. So I think we have to be pay particular attention to how that protest paradigm or uh, reporting on protests uh, that favors sort of that status quo, how that's being reported. Um, and so while I think this is also true, I also think that what we're seeing with media professionals, um, when they start to look more like the protesters, um, you might see coverage that reflects that, right? Um, um, and uh, you might see more coverage, especially coming out of independent spaces where there's um, more generates more sympathy toward the protesters. And I, and I personally think that's a good thing. Um, I, I always talk about Don Lemon. I know he's like this, this kind of big media example, but as sort of a case study as a black journalist who's come through Ferguson reporting through Ferguson and now reporting um, and what we're seeing now, um, it's interesting to watch him kind of do this sort of sort of dance where he still does play up the status quo in the form of, you know, reiterating peaceful protests, right? It's always, it's gotta be peaceful. That's the only right way to protest. Um, and, you know, I've also taken stock of how mainstream media re reports on the discourse around defunding um, the police. Uh, there will always be that caveat. It's, it's not so much that we want to get rid of the police. It's not, it's not so much that. It's just we're trying to transform. So I think that, you know, the journalists are playing with that lingo, while at the same time, I think um, especially Black journalists are being challenged in this moment um, to report based on their training. Um, but also see themselves as a platform, um, a platform for, for advocating for racial justice. Um, I'm not a journalist, so I, I can only see what I, what I study. Um, and maybe some, some journalists might not, you know, refer to themselves at all as any kind of advocate when they're reporting, but I think that's kind of the challenge that we're in. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is just kind of the role of social media. This is kind of like my purview, right? Um, Social media has had a significant, played a significant role um, in how protests and racial uh, violence have been covered and reported. Um, I think for everyone on this panel, I, it's no secret that you know journalists are on Twitter, right? Um, and so are activists, and so are protesters, and so are organizers. And so, especially with Twitter, it's kind of this this sort of commons where uh, media institutions meet grassroots activism. And so it's no surprise that we also kind of see sort of the, the social justice rhetoric and, and discourse um, being reflected in, in mainstream spaces, mainstream media, but also in independent media. Um, and I, I think as far as media institutions are concerned, we're, they're, we're still catching up with what's happening with the discourse, with Black Lives Matter discourse in particular. Um, and so I think the difference now, I'll just say, is we're all paying attention. Um, we're all in this moment together. We're all trying to process um, the racial violence and the systemic racism in the form of a public health crisis in a pandemic. Um, and so we're all doing this at the same time and in real time. Um, so, you know, I, I do have some more thoughts about how we can continue to challenge ourselves and I think to make, make the, the, the field better. Um, but, but I'll stop for now. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Tara, and uh, I will come back to you with some of your earlier uh, both writings and the media appearances on how Ferguson and how uh, other uprisings have been covered and, and or, or, or actually covered with a twist or with a, with a particular angle. Uh, but I'll save that for later because I can see there are more questions coming in from the audience. I will move uh, to our next speaker, Amanda Silverman, who is the editorial director of Newsroom at the Mother Jones. Everybody knows the Mother Jones, so no need for further inter introduction. But before I, uh, Amanda starts, once again, a reminder for all the attendees to please post short and succinct questions. Do leave your questions. We want this to be interactive. Um, and you have an opportunity to ask all these amazing journalists and academics about their work as well as about their thoughts. And over to you, Amanda. Thanks. And um, thanks for your insights, Tara. And Andy and Don, it's uh, nice to hear that the Mother Jones newsroom is not alone in feeling what I would call stressed out, to put it lightly, and exhausted just about all of the time. 
uh, you know, we're a small nonprofit newsroom and I think we're facing a lot of the same challenges that you guys just talked about. But, you know, thinking back to late March and early February, as we were all starting to get a handle on what was happening, I think the real challenge for us was finding a way to both rely on and really elevate what I would consider our normal playbook when nothing was normal beyond just working at home and trying to juggle childcare and pets and all of that good stuff, you know, like the, nothing, nothing felt normal news and personal. Um, and what I'd be in my normal playbook for, for Mother Jones is not exactly normal. It's, it's kind of that mm, special sauce that I think really makes Mother Jones stand apart. You know, as, as I think Don made the point, you know, we're not the New York Times. We can take a side. We have the freedom to experiment and we like to do that. We want to tell different stories. We want to challenge how you're thinking about the news. People come to us for deep reporting and for analysis where we're breaking new ground. And it was really easy early on to, to feel so overwhelmed by the news and to lose sight of that fact. And I think, you know, we fell into some challenging patterns pretty early on in the pandemic where we were just trying to keep our heads above water. And we scrambled a little bit, as I'm sure so many newsrooms did. We were like, oh, why don't, why don't you, who knows nothing about supply chains, cover the PPE supply chain? Or why don't you, who writes about prisons, cover testing companies? You know, we were pretty desperate to try to cover our bases. And I think we pretty quickly found that not only were a ton of bigger newsrooms covering the same space, but by leaving uh, our normal playbook behind, we were really not playing to our strengths. Um, and so I think as the pandemic has evolved and just become life, I guess, we've really returned to that playbook and that special sauce. And we've been covering the pandemic the past few months in, in the ways that it touches all of our most important beats and what we know about and where we can bring people new information and new stories. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you guys some quick examples, but in practice, one of our immigration reporters really homed in on COVID infections in ICE detention centers. And he found a handful of unreported instances of men and women actually being pepper sprayed when they asked for updates about the coronavirus in their detention center. Um, another criminal justice reporter was been reporting on the outbreak in San Quentin, which is in our backyard. Um, we had a race and justice reporter join a data reporter for a deep dive into how the pandemic was disproportionately impacting people of color and where. So, you know, naturally, I think once we felt like maybe we had the smallest grip on that, the ground shifted again. You know, as, as Don said, it was like, you're, there's so much incoming and you're dealing with multiple crises at once. And so, while I think we, we scrambled the jets pretty quickly, again, we tried to keep in mind some of those lessons that I was just talking about and really not lose sight of where we could add value even when the news was moving so quickly. Um, and, you know, sorry, John, I, I keep, keep uh, referencing you, but it really rang true to me too when you talked about centering the protesters and that was such a deliberate part of our coverage in our early conversations. And, you know, it, it really kind of echoes what you were saying, Tara, and thinking about even just the most basic language we use. Like, we, you know, we had conversations of when to use the word riot, when that was not appropriate. What is appropriate for a riot? Is it okay that people are rioting? Like, is, you know, how do we shed light on this anger and these abuses that are happening both historically and in real time? And, you know, at the same time, I thought that Mother Jones could really bring, um, you know, extra insight and deeper reporting into the machinations and these dynamics that have really kept these rotten power structures in place. And so one instance is police unions. Very early on, one of our criminal justice reporters, Sam Michaels, was reporting about Bob Crawl in Minneapolis. She has a huge feature in the next print issue, which is not out yet, but about how police unions have Unfortunately, some other places have done this since then, but uh, have been a real impediment to to change. And you know, we've we've talked about how the Justice Department has rolled back consent decrees. Um, 
how the Trump administration has made it possible for officers in DC to go out into Lafayette Park without identification. We read about how Minneapolis police officers don't even live in the city they police. So, you know, it's all sort of under this same umbrella of how, how these systems got so broken. Um, you know, as everyone has said, <clears throat> there was a real challenge in finding ways to send reporters out for both health and financial reasons. You know, Mother Jones is in a, a pretty nice or luckier place, I should say, in that, you know, we rely on a really reliable and, and vast base of donors. Um, and they have been very loyal and stuck with us through this. So we've been in a better place than a lot of newsrooms, but still, you know, finances are hard. Uh, luckily, one of our senior reporters was from Minneapolis and was already going home. So she uh, really turned her family vacation, I would say, into a nonstop reporting trip. And, you know, she was one of the first people to report on cops slashing the tires of protesters and, and medics. And um, she did a great story about a local Sheraton that basically turned into a kind of self-governing pop-up homeless shelter. So, you know, really good stories you weren't seeing elsewhere. So we got quite lucky there. And, you know, we had reporters in New York and in Oakland and in DC who were able to, to go out and, and cover the protests as well. Um, I'll wrap up as I know we're, we're over time a little bit, but you know, I think looking ahead, one of the things that's really important to us is finding the intersection of these these stories. And I think in particular, the disparate racial impact of the coronavirus and how that is dovetailing with this broader racial reckoning we're seeing in everywhere is really important for us. And in that I think will, and how that dovetails with the election, I think will be, you know, a sweet spot for us moving forward. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was a really a comprehensive account. And uh, I mean, I have to say all four speakers have really, uh, you know, recounted and narrated some fascinating uh, stories as well as the insights. I'm sure those who are uh, part of this webinar are, are thoroughly not, not just enjoying uh, uh, this uh, discussion, but also learning a lot from these first-hand experiences and observations. So we have a few questions, quite a few questions actually lined up in our Q&A box, but I did have like one or two issues that I wanted to uh, raise. I mean, the first um, uh, was uh, this whole issue of um, people of color and, uh, you know, COVID-19. I mean, how some of that framing um, attributes biology as somehow responsible for being more, more vulnerable to the virus, while, that's, while actually it's class or it's economic stat, you know, uh, your e economic situation or, or whether you have an insurance or not. So I just want to ask, um, maybe um, I'll ask you, Tara, about this. What What is this whole uh, framing of, um, uh, you know, uh, race and class. I mean, uh, do you see any change, by the way? Uh, well, I, I think within the last, I looked at recently at a study um, within like the last 50 years, we've seen with the George Floyd protests in particular, the most media coverage um, we, we've ever seen in terms of with the, with the protests. So I think there's a difference there in terms of um, the, the rate at which we're covering um, um, race and protest during this moment in the pandemic. Um, but I mean, if I were to do a discourse analysis of again, mainstream media, and even some independent media. I, I'm sure I think I would still find that the way that we report on, um, for example, the disproportionate number of uh, people of color, namely black people who are affected by the pandemic and the, the virus, um, I think we might see, you know, playing into those old stereotypes, those kind of deficit frameworks for how you know, African Americans live, how they eat, where they go. It's, it's like there's a, there's a, a micro, a, a, a micro view of what um, African Americans and how they're experiencing this without necessarily, you know, to Amanda's point, talking about the, um, the external factors, the systemic factors. It's not just, um, it's not just lifestyle, it's environment. It's, um, you know, how uh, local governments, how we're reporting on resources that local governments are, um, 
you know, how they're, how they're responding to, to the virus as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of different facets um, and dynamics at play, and which is also one of the reasons why, I mean, I think supporting local media in particular is so important right now, because what's going to happen is a lot of the reporting on the ground, what's happening in these communities of color um, might not make it to, to uh, or it might make it to mainstream, but it might get, it, the, the framing might be completely um, 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 biased. So um, I, I think there is a difference. I think we're, we are reckoning with this moment as best as we can, but it's also challenging because we are losing those independent um, and local institutions, reporting institutions. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I have a follow-up uh, question uh, uh, from uh, Didi Guttenland. So, uh, Basically, you covered so many issues. So I, I mean, and I have all these notes in front of me. I was trying to scribble them as you, as you were talking. But I mean, I, I'm more interested in in this post pandemic. I mean, you know, a lot of all this theorizing uh, and scenario building about what what kind of world are we going to live in after COVID-19 is over, post-pandemic, you know, narratives. So where do you see, I mean, the media, uh, particularly the independent media, you know, non-profit journalism or which relies on, on, on uh, sponsorships or subscriptions or foundations? I mean, um, what is your assessment on, on that front? Sure, I'll answer that, but can I also, Please uh, push off a little bit, not against, but with what Tara was saying, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think Go ahead. I, I think our experience was, well, my personal experience was we ran stories early on about the disparate impact of COVID-19 uh, on different populations. And we thought it was important, but I worried while I was doing it, because I worried, like somebody's going to tell Donald Trump that this disease is killing black and brown people. And he's gonna, he's gonna think that's fine. And you know, that pretty much happened. I'm not saying it happened because I said it, but it, you know, if you look at the government response and the point at which they stopped trying to do very much about it, it was pretty coincidental in time with when the disparate impact stories came out. So that's one piece of it that I, I feel we need to notice. The other thing is, you know, as um, Barbara Field says in Racecraft, Race is a fiction, but racism is real. And I think what's one of the things that I worry about in the way we cover disparate impacts is that we um, reify these categories, which are not biologically grounded uh, and which don't have any biological or genetic basis. So the people are talking about, you know, the susceptibility of black populations as if that was a thing, you know, and it's not a thing. Uh, so there's a, we have uh, Patricia Williams, who's one of our uh, longtime columnists and writers, is writing about this. She's writing about the reification of race in response to uh, our coverage of the pandemic. But I think it's something that, that all of us who cover the pandemic should be aware of in, in thinking of how we cover it. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, now, in terms of the post-pandemic environment and the role of, you know, alternative or progressive media or independent media. I mean, we've tried to do with the nation a couple of things. We were early on when we realized that this was a crisis. Uh, we ran an, an issue about don't waste this crisis, which was basically uh, arguing that, you know, I think it was Kiyangi Yamada Taylor said in the New Yorker that, uh, you know, that Biden won the primary, but reality endorsed Bernie Sanders, and certainly on health care and the, the need for the, the, you know, the, the clear inadequacy of our current fee-based, job-linked, privatized health care system to respond to a pandemic. So, you know, I think part of it is we have to imagine a different world and we have to start imagining it now. So we have to do both practical and utopian thinking. You know, we have to let ourselves think about what kind of world might be possible after this. And we have to do the practical thinking about how do we get there from here? How do we do the organizing? How do we make the case? What kind of data do we need? And those are all questions that, you know, mostly the New York Times is never going to ask. So we need to be the people asking those questions. And as much as we can, we need to be, need to be the media organizations, you know, and I very much, 
you know, include Mother Jones and the Independent in this category of the people who are asking those questions. Uh, so I think we need to do that. And then I guess finally, it seems to me that both post pandemic and in the current uprising, I don't know what label I'd use or what word I'd put on it, but a whole lot of things are in flux. And it feels to me like uh, a time for maximal demands. And so I feel like part of our role as independent media is to, to listen to the people who we cover and who we, whose experiences we center and to try and amplify and refine and reflect their maximal demands. You know, and so, you know, get your foot off my neck is not a maximal demand. That's a minimal demand. Defund the police, disarm the police, which is a, an editorial I wrote a few, be, a, a few weeks back in the nation. Those are, those are maximal demands. And what does it mean? You know, what, is it, what, did, what would defunding the police mean? What would abolishing the police mean? What would community-centered public safety be? And would you need people in uniforms with guns on their hips and, hip, and handcuffs you know, on their belts to deliver that? And, you know, and if not, how would you deliver it? And how can we get there? And how can we pay for it? And where can we find the money to pay for it within current city budgets. So, you know, those are the kinds of questions I feel we've been trying to ask at the nation and we've been trying to entertain ranges of answers. But I feel like that's a crucial part of our role as independent media in this triple crisis is to, to ask these questions and help formulate maximal demand. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, uh, we have uh, many questions now coming up, so I would uh, uh, once again thank uh, all those participants who are posting their questions. Please keep them short. Once again, a gentle reminder. Uh, I'm, uh, um, uh, Andrew, there's a, there's a question from one of uh, the participants about uh, what differences do you see uh, in reporting in the United States and the UK? So I guess you can address that right away because I was going to ask you that anyway, uh, because you've also covered uh, many countries in Asia and uh, now, uh, but I think you were arrested here in the US. So it, it is a, um, uh, an important area that you could perhaps uh, enlighten us all about. Uh, unmute please. No, you, you're still muted, Andrew. Okay. Are you yeah. there? Yes. I was kind of hoping to dodge that question because I haven't lived in the UK for the best part of 20 years, but I, I, I can give it a shot. I mean, one of the things that um, strikes me, you know, th this is someone who knows uh, uh, America and, you know, is very fond of the country and is very aware of the privilege he has to live here. Um, but essentially with an outsider's view, one, one of the things that strikes me uh, is fundamentally different about reporting on race uh, in America. And again, you know, it's the caveat of me saying this as a white middle class guy from England is that nobody wants to, let me get, most people, white people don't want to talk about the fundamental problem. Most people don't want to talk about uh, the systemic stuff. You now we can go on sort of, we can have sort of nice pictures of moms from Portland all lining up and we all like that. We get a buzz out of that. But white people generally don't want to talk about the biggest issue, which is like 400, 400 years of slavery, um, discrimination, 500 years, if you want to sort of take in the fact that sort of the, the genocide of, um, of, of indigenous populations. But it seems to me that until you have, until this nation can have that conversation, it's going to go nowhere because the criminal justice system of America isn't flawed. It's not, it's not, it's not kind of not working. It's working perfectly well. It was, it's doing exactly what it was designed to do, which was to repress black people and poor people and people of color. And it kind of came after the sort of the failure of um, reconstruction and uh, Jim Crow and, you know, re what replaced slavery was kind of slave labor and prisons and redlining. And so 
the idea that there's a, a few tweaks going on out there, uh, uh, we're going to have some little kind of tweak to the system and everything's going to be better, to me, feel, seems misguided. I think there is a huge reckoning that needs to be happened about acknowledging uh, the role of slavery in the United States, both in establishing um, its you know, key institutions, but also its wealth. Um, why is it that uh, the average black family has one tenth of the average wealth of the average white family. That seems to me staggering. I remember flying down to El Paso. Oh, when was it? Last, last year for the, that terrible shooting at the Walmart. Another race hate shooting. And I'm on, the, I'm on the plane. I'm chatting to this woman about who might be a, a good, you know, democratic choice uh, for, 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 for the president. And, and I'm saying I really like Kamala Harris. She's really smart. She's very sort of uh, she's very provocative and she's very dynamic and she's kind of got a lot of, oh yeah, but this reparation stuff, you know, she's too radical. I'm saying, what do you mean, you know, rad reparation, surely sort of acknowledging what happened. Um, you know, this is on the flight to a, to a hate crime and no, no, we can't have a conversation about um, slavery and reparation. So as a kind of like foreigner, again, uh, and aware of the, the, you know, the insight and lack of insight that provides, I kind of think something really fundamental needs to happen, a really fundamental conversation about the, that acknowledges these things and then actually addresses moving forward and how uh, the, the nation can be more equitable. Thank you very much, Andy. That was uh, uh, that answered many questions, actually. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm going to uh, go to our uh, list of questions posted by our participants. The first one is by uh, I mean, actually, there are two questions by Maura Stephens, uh, who is a former colleague at Ithaca College, and thank you for joining, Maura. Uh, first question is: Are you worried about not having the wherewithal to sufficiently cover? the authoritarian militaristic crackdowns on peaceful protesters that are happening nationwide? And her second question is on a different tone. What positive permanent changes do you see yourselves carrying over from COVID times to the longer term? So uh, maybe I think I will ask you, Amanda, I, uh, about this uh, wherewithal uh, to sufficiently cover the authoritarian crackdowns on peaceful protesters that are happening nationwide. Sure. I mean, th that that's a challenging question. And, you know, as I said earlier, it's hard, just given the the limitations of, of travel and finances right now to send people out everywhere we would probably like to. And I think, to come back to something I said earlier, at least at Mother Jones, we try to keep in mind that we can't cover everything. And, you know, as, a, as I was saying earlier, we try to play to our strengths. So can we cover every single development of this escalation and militarization on, in our cities? No, we can't. But how can we do our best to make sure that that story is still told? And so we have a few people covering this full time from their respective locations, both in San Francisco and DC. Um, and one of our reporters in DC has been really beating the drum drum about unidentified officers starting from when he he actually was one of the first people to to tweet some pictures of unidentified officers on the streets just before the lafayette square incident um so he's been covering that a lot and then our our criminal justice reporter who i mentioned earlier who wrote about police unions has been writing about operation legend and what exactly is happening in kansas city and how that differs from what's happening in portland and now seattle but you know, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't challenging to try to keep up with and do from our you know home bases. Um, I don't know if I exactly answered your question. Um, uh, I think you've you've uh, addressed it in the main. I can go to okay. uh, Didi Gutten plan because I want to ask him about the second question about sure. is there anything positive going forward? Uh, given all that is happening, and maybe you can also comment on this particular question of having the required wherewithal to cover uh, so much that is happening across the nation. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I have much to add to what Amanda said. 
Uh, she answered very eloquently about the difficulties and the needs to, to pick your targets. The only thing I would throw in is that, um, you know, we're very aware at the nation of being both uh, a daily online publication and a print publication. And, um, and we're aware that there's a difference in uh, almost a segmentation by age in our audience. So for example, our younger audience who are mostly online, they don't really rely on us to tell them something's kicking off in Portland. You know, they'll get that from Twitter or they'll get that from Facebook. And yes, I would love to, <laughs> when I, I tell my, my staff almost every week that we're not two media organizations. We're not the New York Times and we're not the AP. So, you know, we don't need to be everywhere uh, and we can take sides. <laughs> and so uh, we, we don't need to be everywhere it's kicking off, but if it's kicking off in a way that's different or, or there's a dimension of it, you know, I mean, we've had, Ken Klippenstein has had scoop after scoop after scoop about the, the internal planning and coordination for these federal swoops uh, and the, you know, the federal strategy behind them and the extent to which these things were pre-planned. This wasn't just some, oh, we're gonna send some troops into Portland or some, uh, you know, some, some agents into Portland because things are getting out of hand. They were sending people into Portland anyway. They were just waiting for a pretext to use them. Um, so, you know, we, we cover what we, what we feel, we, where we feel we can add something. And in terms of positive developments, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think as Andrew said, this is the beginning of a very different kind of national conversation on race than we've ever had before. Uh, and, you know, ideas that used to be dismissed as radical, like reparations, uh, are now much more within the mainstream. And also, it's much more in the mainstream for people to, and by people, I mean uh, people of all colors and all ages, to realize that police brutality is real and that police brutality against people of color is real. So I, I feel like, you know, there, there is a dawning realization in all sorts of areas that the system is deeply broken and needs to be replaced uh, not just tinkered with. And I think that's a positive going forward. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, John. And uh, uh, there's a question for Tara um, by Brenda. Are you seeing any conversations in academia that support more studies in your area of expertise? Uh, well, I think what's happening in academia, when, when I say, I guess, academia, I mean my specific field, uh, media and communications, um, there's always conversations <laughs> going on in academia about, you know, the, per, the as media professionals, you know, how do we um, respond to this moment? And I think with, you know, in my field, um, I have a little bit more time uh, to, to think about these issues than maybe some of my panelists, because I know you all are, um, are in the moment and reporting um, as, as things come in. And it's, it's my job to try to make sense of it in the long run um, and, and just kind of reiterate um, the point made earlier about historicizing um, these moments. Um, uh, you know, I'll just I'll just kind of um, say this too. Um, you know, in terms of the positive aspect to come out of this, and I think all of the panelists have alluded to it, um, is that we are in a moment of reckoning, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But what I what I'm concerned about, and, and I'm going to keep you know um, beating this drum, is that you know when we get out of this moment, if we get out of this moment, where are institutions going to be? Um, I think it's important for any you know, uh, uh, civil society to have strong institutions. And I'm not talking about carceral institutions. I'm not talking, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the institutions that sustain um, how we express ourselves, um, how we tell stories about the world around, about the world around us. So my, my concern is even as we are in the moment reckoning with race, reckoning with um, how to talk about it, how to report about it. I hope too that we have the foresight to think um, about where our institutions are gonna be on the other side. Um, will they be ready to catch us when, when we're, we're falling? Um, um, and so for anyone who's watching now, I, I just wanna reiterate, it's so, so important to support um, local and independent media, especially the folks here 
here on this panel um, because what the kind of reporting that we need right now, that we seriously need right now, is the kind that goes into our local communities, the kind of, that is sustained, investigative, um, and that does that kind of historical, historicizing, and contextualizing work that, that we might not see um, every day um, in other mainstream outlets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, there's a question by Fred Balfour who says, why does U.S. journalism uh, not embed comparisons between U.S. and specific countries as part of larger pieces? For example, Taiwan and Australia have similar populations to New York State, but COVID-19 deaths are uh, way higher in the U.S. And compare comparisons between Taiwan, Australia, and U.S. are straightforward as to how they did it. So I don't know, maybe Amanda, do you want to respond to that? Uh, sure. Um you know, something we talked about doing a few months ago was trying to actually chart the U.S. response and the South Korean response to the pandemic, because if, I, if I'm not mistaken, our first cases were documented within the same week, and obviously our paths have diverged greatly. It ended up becoming a, a, a much more complicated task than I think we initially envisioned, but this is just to say that I, I don't think that that thinking is lost in newsrooms, and I'm actually not sure that it's never alluded to. Um, I, I, you know, I feel like we haven't been knocking the New York Times, but I do think the New York Times has done a good job actually putting in context the, the population size and will often compare certain individual U.S. states to other countries. And I, in fact, I, their amazing data team has done a lot of that work. Uh, I think that, you know, this is just to say that it is a part of our conversations. It might not always make it into stories, but I would be curious to hear, particularly from our other panelists, kind of what, what value they think that could bring or, and why that might be missing. Okay, yes, great. Uh, Andrew, your quick comment on that one about, about these comparisons uh, between comparable states or regions. Listen, I think it's always, there's always great value in putting those in. And I think that, um, you know, I think we should all be doing for, we should all be doing for it. But sometimes I think uh, they can also make for false comparison. May have the same number of people as uh, New York City and it might be doing better, but that's kind of part of the story. You know, I want to know why the United States the richest country in the world is doing so badly uh, at dealing with the coronavirus. And, you know, I, I, I'm struck, in the, struck every day and horrified every day by the sort of the, the wanton disregard and lack of leadership that comes from the White House. I'm very fortunate that I live in a state that, uh, and, and a city where science seems dominant. But to me, um, you know, what the White House has done, it's fantastical. I mean, uh, and, and, and I mean that in the world of, in the world of not fantastic, but in extraordinarily terrible. And, and so I think for us to say, okay, we can make a comparison between how did uh, South Korea do this compared to what Governor Como did, that might be useful. That, that, I think that is a very good story, a specific story. I, I, I think it, there is also sort of so much to be done standing back, seeing the big picture, putting those dots together, linking stuff and saying, why is the United States failing time and time after again on this? Is it because of federalism? Is it because Trump isn't interested? Is it because people in the United States and Britain and Sweden uh, don't like taking orders from government and don't want to wear masks? Those to me perhaps are, the, uh, are questions that um, need to be asked more or attendant to should I say, stories about how Seoul responded to the crisis. Right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I, would, I would like to get other points of view, but I have uh, many questions in front of me to uh, ensure at least they're addressed uh, um, as far as possible. So again, there's this question uh, about um, uh, how do you prioritize uh, the events or topics you cover when so much is happening currently? I think it was asked again in a different manner by Maddie Meal, but I think it's a good uh, uh, point to revisit. I mean, Amanda, would you like to 
comment a little bit on how you as the newsroom editorial director, I mean, you did mention in your earlier response, but a specific process, you know, with all the resource constraints and the challenges and the, et cetera. Sure. I'd like to pretend that it's a seamless process, but it is not. Um, and it is, it is messy. And I think Don alluded to many Zoom meetings, and that is certainly what's happening in our newsroom as well. Three times a week, you know, this is very detailed, but the, the editors have a Zoom call and, and we basically address this exact thing, but all day in Slack, we're kind of constantly reassessing priorities. Um, you know, this kind of came to head this week, actually, in which uh, a reporter I mentioned earlier, Dan, his name's Dan Friedman, he works out of DC and had been reporting a lot about Portland, but he's also, you know, one of our top reporters on the Russia investigation and Bill Barr was testifying yesterday while there was stuff happening in Portland. How do you decide what Dan's gonna do? Uh, so that was just a conversation we had to have and Dan wrote up something about Bill Barr yesterday and his hearing on the Hill and today he was back on Portland. So, you know, luckily we're small so we can be pretty nimble and our bosses, the boss bosses are very accommodating and really let the newsroom and their reporters and their individual editors um, set their priorities and their agenda for, for the most part. So it's, it's pretty collaborative, um, but it, you know, it's hard and it's a trade-off. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was a, a, a very comprehensive response. So I do have another question for uh, DD Gutton plan and maybe uh, uh, Dawn, you could add to what Amanda just said about uh, prioritization of stories. So the question from you comes from Professor Stuart uh, Ayush, who is a professor at Ithaca College um, and a guru of public policy and health policy and all matters uh, concerning that. Uh, so his question is an opinion piece in the nation by Sonia Shah argued that we need to shift the story about the pandemic from one that focuses on our being attacked by a virus and using military like metaphors to a story about how humans, governments and societies have created systems that allowed the virus to develop and threaten us all. Thus, I ask, has Shah's perspective shifted uh, uh, the uh, idea of, or had an impact on the way Nation has addressed the topics and, and do the reporters who work with you, Don, agree with Shah's argument and, um, and the approach? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, she takes a very radical view, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, am I entirely convinced myself? I'm not sure. Uh, but did I think it was worth thinking about? Yes. Uh, one of the things that's worth pointing out about Sonia Shah is that she wrote a piece uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic about the extent to which human encroachment on uh, animal habitat made trans-species migration of diseases much more likely and much easier. So I think I would say I would like us to be more aware of the systemic aspects of this. And I would like us to try to steer away from reaching so easily for, you know, metaphors of invasion and war and eradication. Uh, and, you know, I think it would be better for us as humans to come to more of a holistic awareness that, you know, we live with lots of other species and we have to find a way to carry on living with other species that allows us to flourish uh, and doesn't, you know, destroy the ecosystem. Um, you know, something that nobody said today, but that I'm sure they've said at Mother Jones and we've said at The Nation a lot is that uh, the coronavirus pandemic is in a way its own disaster, but it's also a dress rehearsal for a much bigger disaster, which is climate change. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to the extent that we can't even respond to this one, particularly the United States, uh, that is cause for great anxiety and disquiet about our ability to respond to something that, you know, threatens the whole planet and is going to be a whole lot harder, in fact, to divert from the course of disaster that we're currently embarked on. Uh, so to the extent that I think Sonia Shah's, what's the word I want, paradigm shift, uh, can allow us or help us to think in bold new ways, 
uh, then I'm happy to embrace it. Yeah, but do I think every reporter who we asked to go out and cover the paradox, cover the pandemic, has to pass an exam on Sonia Shah's story first? No, we don't want okay. to get <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, there's a question by Teddy. Uh, Brian, um, what is your take on cancel cult culture and what is a fair way to critique someone's behavior or speech? So um, uh, I'll come to you, Tara. Uh, maybe you can, uh, your thoughts will be welcome on this one. <laughs> Oh boy, cancel culture. Yeah. <laughs> what are my thoughts on cancel culture? I think we, um, I, I think we have, I think we have a tendency to to name things that we, that either we try to dismiss too quickly or don't necessarily understand quite yet. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing right now. I know folks are very much aware of the the letter that came out. I don't know last week or so. I don't. I don't know what time is anymore. Um, the Harper's letter. <laughs> um, I, I, I would love to hear what you all think about that as well, but I'll just speak on it from just, again, a framing and a messaging standpoint and just the way that we use language to describe the moment. Again, I think we're trying to figure that out. Um, with everything happening. Um, we are in this like 1918 uh, post uh, depression era. We don't know what's coming up next. We're also in the civil rights movement, like one of the other panelists said. So um, I think we're just still trying to find a language for what it means when, you know, the world is changing. There's certain things that, that just don't fly anymore that, that, that did maybe in the 90s or in the, in the alts. And I think that's a good thing. I think people should be held accountable <laughs> the things that they say um, without getting too much into the weeds of, and, and talking too specifically about certain journalists. Um, I, um, again, I, I think we, we have to just be prepared to be uncomfortable in this moment. And there's a lot of people that, you know, are going to lose um, their sense of, of security, whether that's their, you know, their, their perspective that they've held onto, their ideologies that they've held onto for so long that's gotten them so far in um, media and communications or journalism. Um, I think we have to adapt. That's what we do best as humans. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think cancel culture is a thing, but it's not, it's, I think it's something that we're still trying to figure out and people are trying to find language for. Um, but I, I'd definitely be interested in hearing what the other panelists think. Raza, you're muted. We don't hear you. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so we'll just take one uh, more response from the panelists because we are running short of time and there's still many questions to address. So I don't know who wants to address the cancel culture uh, question. Um, Amanda, Dawn, Andy. Okay, Amanda, please. Sure. Um, I just wanted to uh, amplify what you said, Tara, about people feeling uncomfortable right now. And I think that that is both okay and actually a good thing. Uh, and it's ha it's happening in everyone's personal lives. It's happening in everyone's professional lives. And I think, I'll, you know, this is coming at the question from sideways a little bit, but I think being able to sit with and discuss our discomfort in a new way is a good thing that will come out of this moment, hopefully, and will create some real conversations and some real change, but I think not shying away from these conversations that I think we've all avoided for a long time is really important. Right. Thank you. And there was a question uh, uh, for you, Andy, I think uh, in response to your remarks about uh, uh, why, uh, let me just uh, get that in front of me, that why uh, um, your comment is on point. Uh, that's by Brenda. Uh, uh, and my follow-up question is why is it's so uncomfortable for white middle class to acknowledge the disparities. It is, I know it's a broad question, uh, but if you could give a quick response so that we can move on to the other question. Well, I think it's because it's, aw it's awkward. It's, it's painful, it's awkward. And perhaps people don't like to, people don't like to, um, to, to, to acknowledge it because they might want to tell themselves that they're in this job or, or this position or their family is wealthy or they have this kind of, you know, this place at school, uh, an Ivy League school because of their hard work or their brilliance or their 
endeavor, all their creativity. They don't want to, you know, contextualize it with uh, a foundation of racism and, and, and discrimination. Um, uh, there's a writer called Rachel Swans who who did all that amazing work about the uh, the, the slavery um, holdings by Georgetown University. I asked her this question. I asked her this: Why was it so difficult for people? And she says that you know it's hard history. It's difficult stuff. The coming together um, and having these conversations are hard. And you know how we all go forward to deal with this thing. Amanda pointed out. But you know, people are having conversations, and maybe that's one of the things that you know the positives. You know, hopefully so. But one of the things that makes me positive as a reporter when I go around, uh, rather than negative, is I have massive faith in, in, in the next generation. I mean, my you know my generation screwed it up. But whether I'm looking at the guys at Parkland who 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 kind of responded so fantastically to that terrible tragedy whether it's looking at community, community organizers in Minneapolis in the aftermath of George Brown's, uh, uh, George Floyd's murder. Um, when I meet young people doing their stuff, I'm just so in awe and so impressed and thinking, wow, where, where do you, you know, when do you get so smart? So I kind of think actually we're in pretty good shape. And I, I, I don't think it's a gamble. I think they're going to be far better at having the conversation than my, than my generation is. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. There's a question by Robert Parks on uh, Report for America Project, uh, reportforamerica.org. And Robert wishes to know, is this project a viable new direction for independent media? I don't know if anyone knows about it. And if you want to comment, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can move on to the next question. Anyone knows, Amanda or Don? Have you heard of this? reportforamerica.org. Yes, no, I, I, I met some people from reportforamerica.org actually at the NABJ convention last year in uh, Miami uh, in August. So it was almost a year ago. Uh, and I think what they do is very interesting. Uh, I think it sounds like a useful experience for the people who do it. It sounds like a godsend for some of the newsrooms that get the people who do it. But I guess my reservation is, you know, the whole journalism model that we all, <laughs> we, particularly my and Andrew's generation, if I can presume, Andrew, to group you in my dinosaurish generation, uh, grew up in, uh, you know, that just doesn't work anymore. And I don't think, I mean, Report for America is a way maybe to give a more diverse group of people a route into journalism, but Look at it this way. If you had a really great project that was giving people a more diverse route into becoming blacksmiths, it wouldn't really be, <laughs> it wouldn't address the problem that there were no jobs for blacksmiths, you know? Uh, yeah, right. So, right. Uh, so I, I feel like it's useful, but it's not found, it's not going to save us. Okay. So uh, we just have a time for just one or two more questions, because then I want to give an opportunity for all speakers to have a final sort of takeaway or uh, summary. So Jay Bradley says, how do you think this uh, uh, will continue to affect the presidential election in the fall? Will we see things like a, a video chat debate, in, if any debate at all? So maybe, uh, Don, if you could respond in like 30 seconds, I'm sorry to... Sure. Place that <laughs> yeah, well, as somebody who covered the debates in 2016 and who remembers debates going back, well, before some of our audience was born, um, I hope we have real debates where they're both in the same room. And I think they, they ought to be willing to. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a big crew. Um, but I think, you know, I guess my question is not so much, are there going to be debates, but are we going to have an election? Is it going to be a fair election and is Trump going to abide by the results? So those are the things that keep me up at night, not whether or not we'll have debates. Yeah, that is indeed a very <laughs> important uh, point. So I'll, um, I'll end the, the Q&A with this question by Harrison Malikin, uh, who says, is there, a, a, is there um, a set in-house definition of fascism? And is it too negative to uh, use it while covering President Trump. Um, I don't know, maybe Andy or Amanda, you could 
take that? Go for it, Andy. Yeah. Oh, I was about to say the same to you. I, I mean, I, I don't really have a good answer. Um, um, I, uh, listen, you know, I, words are all useful. I think sort of sometimes, um, sometimes the, tr the trick with Donald Trump is to get out of the way of him and just report what he says. And, uh, you know, I don't think we need to call him a fascist or a Nazi or whatever. Uh, we, you know, you, 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 not that I'm saying those labels might not be helpful. I don't have an issue saying that, saying that he uses racist words. I think that's fine. But I think um, you can get too hung up on uh, you know, how you describe him. He, he doesn't, you, you know, as journalists, sometimes sort of we, we, I think we sort of um, worry about, worry too much about uh, how to stylize stuff. You know, you know we, when you're reporting about Donald Trump, he, he needs very little kind of, um, you know, top and tailing, report what he says, put it in the historical context and let his words speak for themselves, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, uh, I would have asked others to uh, jump in because this is a very interesting and, and important question, if I may add. But we are running short of time. I would uh, request all four of you uh, to give a one minute, roughly one minute long uh, final word or final takeaway. And if you could say something to uh, some of our participants, um, in fact, many of them are students, either incoming uh, first years or already uh, enrolled in, di in different colleges. So any kind of advice you have along with your concluding remark. So maybe we can start, I don't know, Don, with you? Sure. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of divide my minute in half, or maybe, okay, maybe a third and two thirds. I, I actually wanna answer the question about fascism because I think it's an important one. Please. And say that it doesn't matter so much what we call Donald Trump. I do think that it's important not to shy away from the truth. Um, but to me, it, it matters, you know, whether Trump wants to be a fascist to me is a less interesting question than whether we're going to let him become one. And I think that's, that's where we need to be careful about what we say. I mean, there's no point pretending while we have a functioning First Amendment that America is a fascist state. There's lots of injustice in America and lots of things we need to not just fix, but burn down and start again. But uh, you know, to pretend that, that we are in 1933 Germany does nobody any favors. Um, with young, to young people, I would say this, particularly if you want to become journalists, um, there's always going to be a need for storytellers. And there's always going to be a hunger for people who can find a way to tell stories that uh, resonate with people, that move them, and that ring true. So, you know, I can't tell you what the medium is going to be. I mean, you know, if you look at the electric typewriter I took with me when I went to college, you'll laugh. So, you know, your, your tool may be your telephone. Uh, I may be something that hasn't been invented yet, but I think, and you know, and how are you going to make a living at it? That's another question, you know, but that's a question that a lot of us are going to be facing in a lot of different jobs. How are we going to make a living at it? Particularly in this kind of post COVID depression where lots of jobs that, you know, used to exist. My youngest son's a jazz musician. You know, how are you going to have people playing music together in rooms and getting paid for that? So a lot of professions are going to have to reinvent themselves, and journalism is probably going to be one of them. But I would say if you can find a way to tell stories, use language, rejoice in language, uh, you know, then there ought to be a way to carry on doing that and hopefully a way to make a living doing that, particularly if you can tell people the truth. Thank you so much. So, so inspirational. Andrew, uh, over to you. Well, I'll just say this about, um, uh, about journalism. A, I think it's uh, the, the, the most privileged job in the world. We get to ask questions of everyone. We get to ask questions of presidents. We get to ask questions of council members. We get to ask questions of our neighbors. It's also a job that uh, carries with it you know, massive responsibility. How do we use this privilege? How do we use this power? Do we really want to write about celebrities? Well, I'm not saying that people aren't interested in them. They certainly are. But is that what you want to spend your time doing? Maybe not. 
Um, uh, but let, let me also say this, there is massive need in this world right now for, for journalists who have the passion to stand up and to be counted and to get out there. And bear in mind that everyone you meet has a story to tell. It doesn't have to be going on a trip to Minneapolis to interview George Floyd's brother or what have you. Everyone has a story. It just needs the time and the willingness to sit and listen to them. And um, I think if you remember that and bear that in mind, you have fantastic careers ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tara. <laughs> yes, I, I, I love that um, both um, Don and Andrew just kind of hit home the point about storytelling. Um, my favorite philosopher and novelist, Sylvia Winter, she talks about this idea that we are storytelling species. Um, so for you know young uh, budding media professionals and journalists, I, I would take that, that quote and, and walk with it, walk into your purpose. Um, but I also want to just um, make note of two things um, going forward that I think are gonna be big issues um, in uh, news media and journalism, thinking about how we archive our pro the, the content from our protests, what happens to the images that we see, that we, that we use, um, where do they go? It's a wonderful organization documenting the now that works with communities that helps journalists and reporters do that kind of archival work. I also think another issue that we brought up with this is enhancing the privacy of protesters. I know a lot of independent media are doing that, and I know there's some folks that aren't you know, doing that, but I think that's going to be a, a very much a pressing issue um, coming up. And I would just leave with, I have you know, just three questions that I would just leave the, the panelists and the participants with. Um, Ask yourself, what other aspects of social movements besides protests, like the slow parts, um, that, what are those slow parts that need to be covered? And how do we do that? Um, and what does it mean to cover politically active human beings in this moment? Um, and then, of course, how do we cover political activism that isn't, again, without cultural, social, and historical context? So I hope that you take those questions again and, and, and walk in your purpose, as, as they say. Thank you. Thank you for such profound remarks. Uh, Amanda, you're the last one. And may I request you to keep it under a minute, please? Sure. Um, I would just say that often when people ask, should I go into journalism, a lot of people say, oh God, if you really want to like slog uphill, right? Now it's a horrible time. I, I would add to what my fellow panelists have said and say now is actually a great time. There are not a lot of jobs, but as everyone else said, there are so many stories to tell. I just said this is some of the most exhausting months of my life, but it makes work that much more exciting. And I will also just add that the conversations that media is having right now about equity and democratization of the newsrooms and race and gender and all forms of representation are so important and will pave the way for hopefully this next generation of journalists to have more space and more voice and more representation. Thank you so much uh, to <clears throat> all four speakers and uh, for your time and for really in insightful discussions. I mean, I'm sure I've enjoyed them very much and learned quite a bit and so have our, uh, our participants. I would like to end uh, this note, uh, this uh, webinar uh, with a note of thanks for all those who have joined this afternoon and in particular my colleagues who have uh, helped in putting this together. Brandy Hawley, who is the assistant to uh, the center that I run, and Brandy is a pillar of support. But most importantly, uh, Dr. Patricia Zimmerman, who is a professor at Ithaca College, but she, uh, you know, really uh, has been a guiding uh, spirit for all these events and engagement in the public domain. And today she was our back end producer as well. And uh, Ari, Ari Kaiselov, who's an assistant professor of communication, as you can see on this slide. Ari is, uh, is an, uh, our, our tech guru, as well as our intellectual advisor. And last but not the least, Jeremy Lovelet, who is our research assistant at the center, who has been uh, posting all the links and tweeting about this event. Uh, so I would like to thank everyone once again, and goodbye until we see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>